<laughs> Thank you so much, Dean. Th thanks so much for your leadership. Thrilled to be here. And I always remind people that I was playing against Snoop Dogg. That was not real basketball. So <laughs> please take it with a big, big grain of salt. Um, I'm thrilled to be here this morning, my friend John. Thrilled actually not to be giving a speech. I can just do an introduction, sit down and listen. So I'm uh, really going to enjoy this morning. Um, but, but John's a remarkable leader. He's a, an educator, true and true. Uh, amazing former teacher. Helped to co-found a school. Ran a great network of schools. Former principal. Um, he's lived this every single day. And I think in education, we all know it takes two things. It takes great intellect, it takes a real head for this, but it also takes real heart and passion. And John is one of those rare leaders who I think combines those two. As you'll see, he's as smart and as thoughtful as anyone uh, working in this space. But as important, and frankly more importantly to me, is his heart, is his passion for this work. And as you'll hear, um, he was a young man who had some real difficulties. He was orphaned by the age of 12. Um, had some teachers and educators step up and help to guide him through some difficult times. Um, he's been very successful. He's also had some challenges. He's been expelled from school. I don't know how many people in this room have been expelled from school. John has. Um, <laughs> didn't, didn't stop him. Kept, didn't stop him. Kept moving. And when I hear him talk about... He wasn't on the resume. Yeah. <laughs> when I hear him talk about what education has meant to his life, it reminds me so much of when I hear the president talk about what education meant in his life, when the first lady talks about what education meant in her life. And the president wasn't born of a silver spoon in his mouth. Dad wasn't around, wasn't welfare parts of his life. Uh, first lady, a little bit different, very, very strong family, but neither one of her parents went to college. She and her brother were first generation. She talked about teachers telling her not to aspire to go to an Ivy League school. It's too good for her. Talked about her own insecurities because of that and challenges overcoming that. And the battles that John has fought has been very, very similar. So for folks who sort of think of education as an ivory tower exercise or an intellectual act, exercise, um, it's not. This work is very, very personal for leaders to make a difference. And whether it's the president, whether it's the first lady, or whether it's John King, these are people who are who they are because they received a world-class education and because they had world-class educators in their lives. And the goal is to how we take those kinds of experiences to scale so that every child has that kind of chance. Um, here in New York City, in New York State, nothing's ever easy. Always lots of drama and noise, and the media loves to pay attention to that. Um, I, have a, I, I think the, the luxury of being a step removed from it. And what I see, actually, is an amazing, amazing opportunity for both the city of New York, but more importantly, the state uh, of, uh, of New York, to help lead the country where we need to go. Um, you have a governor who has been a profile in courage around teacher evaluation, trying to really elevate and strengthen the profession. You have a board chair, Meryl Tisch, who's been a profile in courage, tough as nails, who's made very, very tough calls, not always politically popular, but the right thing for children. You have John King, a state superintendent, who is in the top, whatever, 5%, 10% of superintendents around the nation. I don't say that easily. He's in absolutely the top echelon. You have a new mayor here in New York City who ran and has put all of his political capital behind the hugely important idea of expanding access to high-quality early learning opportunities. The president and I couldn't support that more. So we think about what we can do to help the country for the next 30 years, not the next three. Expanding access to high quality early learning is absolutely at the top of that list. You have a new uh, leader of the New York City schools here, Carmen Farina, who's a passionate veteran educator, extraordinary talent. And so when I look top to bottom, they may not agree on every issue. There are you know, five strong, strong leaders. But you have a chance here from the very top to lead New York state where it needs to go, to lead the city where it needs to go, and more importantly, to lead the country where it needs to go. And the implications, everyone knows here, what happens in the city, in the state, are absolutely national, not local. And for all the noise, for all the drama, for all the whatever, I'm very, very hopeful and very optimistic, frankly, about where this state can go and everything we can do to be a good partner. We want to do that. So I just encourage everyone here to stay the course, to work with tremendous urgency, to also work with humility, and to continue to lead with courage. And none of this change is easy, and John will go into all, in all the details. There's a huge amount of change happening in public education today. Expansion of early childhood education, fantastic, making sure it's high quality, is hugely important. It can't just be access, it has to be helping prepare students to be successful. New set of standards, higher standards. Sounds common sense, college and career ready standards, but anytime you challenge the status quo, anytime you raise the bar, Lots of pushback. That can be very uh, scary. Next generation of assessments, trying to get rid of fill-in-the-bubble tests, trying to evaluate critical thinking skills and other things. Sounds like common sense, 
Change is hard. Change is scary. Thinking very differently about teacher and principal evaluation and support and how we elevate and strengthen the profession. Um, I think teachers are unsung heroes. We have to find ways to shine a spotlight in excellence, recognize it, reward it, compensate teachers at very different levels, create new, teachership, new teacher leadership roles, make sure every school has a great principal. We have to be working in this space. So any one of those changes is difficult. Put them all together in a short amount of time. I promise you the next couple of years will not be easy. There will be bumps, there will be hurdles, there will be roadblocks, and lots of folks will be saying, stop, retreat, go back to the old days. But it's so important this community have a vision of where we're trying to go. And if for the first time ever, not just in the state but across the country, students have access to college and career-ready standards, internationally benchmarked, that truly prepare them, think about that. If we have assessments that are common across states so we can look at who's making improvements and who's not, and move way beyond filling the bubble test and evaluate critical thinking. Think about that. If we can truly elevate and strengthen the teaching profession, at the same time we need to bring in a million new teachers across the country to replace baby boomer generation who are retiring, about a third of the work workforce. Think about the generational opportunity there. And yes, it's hard. Yes, it's a constrained uh, amount of time. But again, the other side of this mountain, um, I think it's going to be something very, very special for children and ultimately uh, education in our nation will go to an entirely different level. And just to emphasize, I'll close with a sense of urgency. For everyone who says things are okay with where we are, let me just walk you through a couple of things. We talked about the, the international benchmarks. On the early childhood side, the United States, the United States ranks somewhere between 25th and 30th among OECD countries in access to high quality early learning. It is a dismal, dismal record. If you look at our, our K-12 data, reading and math, we're somewhere between 15 and 20th. If you look at college graduation rates, one generation ago we were first in the world, today we're 12th. So whether you look at early learning, whether you look at K-12 results, whether you look at higher ed, none of those, none of those are where we as a country can be proud of or where we think we should be. We need to lead the world in college graduation rates. We need to lead the world in access to high quality early learning. We need our students to do better at reading and math and all their other academic skills. And so we have to challenge the status quo every single day. To bring it home quickly to New York City and New York State, uh, in New York City, this is not a perfect measure of dropouts. But whenever I travel to a city, I just look at how many ninth graders they have and how many 12th graders. And right here in New York City, uh, amongst black students, uh, 32,000 ninth graders 19,000 12th graders, 32,000 to 19,000, losing 13,000. Hispanic students, Latino, 39,000 ninth graders, 22,000 12th graders, losing 17,000. So you just put those two, not talk about white students and Asian students, put those two together, that's 30,000 students leaving New York City schools every year. And my question is, where are they going? Where are they going? Are they all going to the NBA? Uh, they're all going to Google and Microsoft and our companies coming here to recruit. And we know the vast majority of that 30,000, fill up Madison Square Garden every single year, the vast majority of that 30,000, we are losing to the streets. And when young people drop out of high school today, they are basically condemned to poverty and social failure. So anyone who's saying we have arrived has no idea how many children we are not serving well yet. That's, uh, I think, epitomizes the, the challenge on the dropout side. Let me talk to you about your high school graduates, not the dropouts. But among your high school graduates going on to the, uh, the, the CUNY system, about 75%, the three quarters, have to take remedial classes in college. So amongst not your dropouts, but amongst your graduates, between two-thirds and three quarters are burning through Pell Grants, taking non-credit bearing classes, taking remedial classes because they were not prepared. So for all of us, we should celebrate the success, celebrate the progress, celebrate the, the, real, the real change that has happened in the city, in the state, in the nation. But I think all of us come to this work every single day with a sense of how do we get better faster? How do we help change students' lives? And for me, this is not just about education. It is a daily fight for social justice. This is the civil rights issue of our generation. It is also an economic imperative. And all of us need to work together Put, put aside the ideology, put aside the politics, put aside the egos, and figure out how we help every single young person in this city, in this state, and in this country get the world-class education they need and deserve. We are so fortunate to have someone of John's uh, intellect, his passion, and his heart leading this work in New York State. Please give him a warm round of applause.